Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Technology, a podcast exploring the latest in computers, networking, home automation, mobile computing, and all things technology related. Our hosts will take a deeper dive into the latest and greatest in tech trends and give you the information you need to enable your tech-centric world. This is... Insights into Technology, Episode 1, Beta Test. This is our first inaugural episode of a new podcast, one that's been actually in the making for uh, several years now. Uh, so in this episode, we are going to give you a glimpse of what the show is going to be about. We'll kind of talk a little bit about the formation and motivation for the show. We'll talk a little bit about my background and, and why I think... Uh, I'm qualified, I guess, for this podcast. Then we're going to talk a little bit about news, which is kind of what this podcast is is geared towards. We're going to talk about some technology news, and then we will talk uh, about our first deep dive on a topic that is near and dear to me. And uh, hopefully things uh, go off without a hitch and everything works out the way I expect, which I pretty much expect everything to be a miserable failure, which it usually is around here, uh, especially, ironically enough, from a technology standpoint. I didn't have enough fires to put out today, so I'm expecting problems. But I'm always expecting problems. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Uh, So let's get into it. Before we do, uh, I would like to take a moment to uh, invite our listening and viewing audience to take a moment to subscribe to the podcast. You can find both audio and video versions of this podcast listed on Insights into Things. It's part of our main lineup at this point. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, not Stitcher. Sorry, Stitcher doesn't exist anymore. i got to remove that from the script. Uh, you can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Twitter or X at insights underscore things. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Uh, you can find links to all of our social media and everything else on our main website at insights into things.com. You can also call in, leave a message for us on our voicemail. And uh, if you'd like us to get you on this one of the shows, please uh, say so accordingly on the message. And assuming it's appropriate for the show, we'll certainly incorporate it. You can call in to 856-403-8788. That's 856-403-8788. And I think it's time that we get into it. So we started podcasting here on Insights into Things uh, about six years ago, a little over six years ago. And when I came up with the concept, not the concept, when I came up with the the idea that I wanted to start a podcast, this was the podcast that I wanted to start. I knew I wanted it to be a video podcast. I knew I wanted it to be high quality audio. I wanted to be able to interview people and and have certain capabilities and so forth. But when we first started out podcasting with Insights into Things, our first show was Insights into Teens. I wanted to ease into it. I wanted us to get to the point where we could produce the the quality level that I was looking for. And you know, we'll take a step back a second here and and I'll give credit to those who kind of inspired this. Um, tech podcasts are not, this is not a unique idea. This is not some grand, brand new cutting edge idea. There's tons of tech podcasts out there and, and those, you know, predecessors really are the ones that kind of inspired me to want to do this because I thought there was a segment of the population out there that 
I could serve as good, if not better than what the tech podcasts were. And I think a lot of the tech podcasts that are out there now are hosted and consulted with and featuring uh, a lot of tech media people, a lot of reporters, a lot of journalists, that type of thing. And uh, the analysis that they provide and the insight that they provide is very valuable. And, you know, I'm not trying to say that they don't use the technology, but their primary focus is not using the technology. And I felt a lot of what I was getting out of these tech podcasts like This Week in Technology or Daily Tech News Show or something like that, I felt it, it wasn't hitting me outside of a consumer perspective standpoint. Working in technology myself as long as I have, there's a lot of stuff that you deal with that you don't deal with from a consumer standpoint. And I felt that a lot of that stuff wasn't being talked about. Like we weren't hearing the challenges and the problems that people working in tech day in and day out encounter. Some of the tips and the hints that they have, things that could help other people that are IT managers or directors of IT or what have you. So that's really what the focus of this podcast is going to be about. It's going to be taking a step back from the consumer look at things and try to look at things from more of a commercial or industrial, you know, using technology in a business environment is really what I'd like to focus on. So the, the folks that I'm going to be talking to primarily are going to be people in the same sort of position that I'm in. I'm a director of IT right now, but they're going to be people that work in the industry. They're going to be people that are using this technology that are dealing with problems and that, that they have to use technology to solve. And that's really where we're going to be looking at. So we'll look at news associated with those. We'll do some analysis of the news. We'll do interviews. Uh, and we're going to do some deep dives into some things. There's a lot of technology that I use frequently. There's new technologies out there that we're always evaluating and so forth. So the idea of coming in and doing a, a deep dive on some of these things was very appealing to me as well. And as as required, I'll bring experts in that can certainly lend additional uh, credence to some of these subjects. But I finally reached a point where about two years ago, we had gotten to the podcast to the production level that I wanted to do and I was comfortable with. And then the last two years, it it basically took two years for me to convince myself to finally do this. And with a couple of the other shows sort of winding down right now, Insights into Teens is kind of going on hiatus for a while now. Um, it may come back in some other form, but I had the time and and I have the equipment already and the, the studio is set up. So I figured this would be a great time to do this. So why am I doing this? What What qualifies me to do this? Well, I've been working in IT over 30 years now in various forms. I started out as a computer specialist working for Radio Shack, both selling and servicing computers and teaching people how to work computers. And this was back in the early 90s where, you know, home computers were like very rare at the time and, and very expensive. I then moved into a help desk role working for dial-up ISPs in the mid to late 90s. And while I was at that company, I moved up through the ranks to an operations manager where I was eventually in charge of all technical operations. We were doing lease lines, co-hosting of servers, web development. I built out their web development uh, department there and was involved in, in sales and service of that. Then I moved over to a level one support role, level one being the top tier support where we're talking directly to developers for a mobile middleware company up in Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, that job was interesting. I moved from that. I did a, played a supporting role with marketing as their um, technical consultant and their webmaster for a period of time. Then I did some quality assurance testing for the uh, API middleware that we produced. And eventually I settled into an IT manager role, which I ran until they basically closed the doors. 
After leaving there, I was actually approached by a former CEO from that company who was working for a rebate processing company down in Delaware. So I went down to consult for him for a little while, which is ironic because I'm was i the type of person that I hate doing rebates. And I always thought it was ironic I wound up working for a rebate company. But they, they lured me in there with the promise of it possibly being a VP of IT role. And I didn't feel comfortable in that at that point in time in my career. I didn't think I was qualified for it. But I said I'd come in, I'd take a look at what he had and what the issues were, and I'd give him an honest evaluation. And, you know, he went down there for a couple of weeks on the engagement, told him he, he doesn't need a VP of IT. What he needs is a project manager to come in here, put this, they had a major development project for one of their customers that just came in that was stalled. They had deadlines that were due, and there was no way they were going to meet their deadlines. So I came in there as a consultant. I helped him get that project back on the track. And uh, they kept me on for a few years after that as a full-time employee handling quality assurance and their IT department. And eventually, I moved on from there to where I'm at now. I came in, ironically, as a business analyst for a electronics manufacturing company in New Jersey. And immediately upon taking that position, I inherited all of technology. Uh, I was the IT guy. They had an MSP that they were engaged with at the time. So I worked hand in hand with the MSP at the time until we could build out an in-house development and an in-house IT department, which is what we run now. We got rid of the uh, MSPs. And I've got my own department that I run now that, you know, if I pat myself on the back a little bit, it actually runs pretty well. So all in all, I've got over 30 years of experience doing this stuff. I've done vendor management. I've done uh, CRM, ERP. I've done upgrades. I've done fresh installs. I've done all kinds of different things. I've done project management roles, department roles. I've done web development. Uh, I'm not a developer. <laughs> I started out. <clears throat> early on in my career uh, doing development and I just didn't like it. I, I didn't have a head for it. I was always better at finding flaws in other people's code than writing it myself. I, I could write flawed code perfectly fine though. Uh, so I moved on from that to, to doing hands-on technical stuff. And then I just seemed to migrate into management roles. It just sort of, it's thrust upon me wherever I seem to go. So that's why I think I'm qualified. I think I've got a lot of experience to draw from, and and the role that I'm currently in is going to hopefully give me a lot more material from which to draw from in the future. So what is the purpose of this podcast? So as I said in the intro here, the purpose of the podcast is to convey and digest technology news but in a way that we look at it as how it affects real people working in the trenches with technology. And that's that's really the niche that I'm trying to, to serve here, the, the group I'm trying to go for. I'm going to speak with experts and leaders in the industry and get their take on emerging technology and the impact the news we discuss has on the world. And then we're going to do a deep dive analysis and, and get an understanding of some select technologies and products out there as we evaluate new technologies. We have a, an episode in the future planned for uh, a deep dive into Unraid, which I'm playing around with. I'm sure we'll have many discussions on artificial intelligence, which I'm neck deep in at this point. There's cybersecurity that we're going to talk about. I work for a company that does contract work for the government so cmmc and a lot of the frameworks are key in the in the uh, roadmap right now for us um but our aim here is to educate entertain and inform and hopefully we can accomplish all those in each episode if not i'll take you know even meatloaf said two out of three in bed i'll take two out of three on each episode if i can get away with it so that's an introduction to what the podcast is. Who am I? Why am I doing this? And why it took me six years to finally get around to doing it. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to get into a couple of news articles. We're not going to go crazy this week. Just a few that jumped out at me as glaringly obvious that I think we need to kind of address. So we'll be back in just a minute.
Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Technology. This is episode one, beta testing, and here's some of the news for this week. So in case you were under a rock somewhere or not paying attention, Apple released their long-awaited iOS 18 along with their new line of iPhones and Apple Watches and so forth. Uh, My iPhone is ordered. My watch is ordered. I've held off on everything else besides that. But I did throw iOS 18 on all of my devices so far. Um, And one would think that this is a consumer-related thing. And while Apple is targeted mainly towards consumers, a lot of companies like mine have standardized on Apple uh, iPhones for their fleet of remote workers for infrastructure reasons. Uh, Apple's infrastructure is a <clears throat> bit more robust and, uh, shall I say, manageable than uh, Android is. Uh, Android's kind of all over the place with what version they have and what carrier you have and what model phone you have. and. Apple, at least, you know, as much as my wife criticizes them for being Apple, it just works with Apple. And that's kind of why this isn't just a consumer related topic here. So OS 18, iOS 18 addresses 33 security vulnerabilities that left iPhones and iPads open to potential exploitation. This comes from securityweek.com. The update resolves several security Uh, key security issues, including vulnerabilities in accessibility, Bluetooth control center, and Wi-Fi, which previously allowed unauthorized access to sensitive data or control over devices. One of the most notable fixes addressed was a flaw in the accessibility component, which allowed attackers to use Siri to view recent photos and retrieve data without unlocking the device. Additionally, a Bluetooth vulnerability was patched that permitted unpaired devices to bypass security protocols. So what impact does this have on commercial operations or industrial operations? Well, businesses like mine that rely on iPhones and iPads for day-to-day operations and communications and secure access to internal systems need to prioritize this update. I know it's difficult pumping things out to users who are remote. Uh, Even some of the most robust mobile device management solutions out there can struggle with remote users because remote users don't always like to play by the rules. But it is very important to get these devices updated. Given the widespread use of Apple devices in the enterprise, Uh, The Bluetooth and Wi-Fi vulnerabilities in particular present serious risks. Unpatched devices could be exploited to infiltrate corporate networks or compromise sensitive operational data. Now, there's a lot of uh, device management overhead that you have to take into consideration. IT teams that are managing mobile devices uh, through an MDM system will need to immediately assess the device compliance and ensure timely updates. Apple obviously promotes or provides a list of compatible devices. And this update goes back pretty far with most devices. So I think if you're using, you're still using an Apple device and it's still functional, chances are this this is probably covered, but you want to check to make sure. Um, This is also going to require increased security scrutiny at this point in time. 
the vulnerability in Siri and Bluetooth, might encourage companies to strengthen their mobile device security policies. Uh, you may not allow people to use certain functions on the phone itself. Stringent controls on the mobile device might be implemented in sectors handling sensitive information, such as finance or even in healthcare. You also have to look at the operational disruption that this can cause. Companies that are using Apple devices for critical industrial processes, such as in IoT environments, where Bluetooth or Wi-Fi integration plays a key role, could face operational risks if the devices are not updated promptly. The flow allowing unpaired devices to bypass security could disrupt industrial automation systems or compromise data integrity. There's also IoT concerns for industrial IoT. With a Bluetooth-enabled IoT devices, they could see heightened risks. So the infiltration itself might not necessarily hit the phone directly. It may come in through an additional device that your, your phones or tablets might actually be attached to. Unpatched devices and environments with numerous interconnected systems may become entry points for attackers, potentially leading to downtime or unauthorized control over critical infrastructure. The good news is all these things are patched. What's kind of scary is they had been out there for some time. So the rapid deployment of iOS 18 will be essential to prevent security breaches, maintain operational continuity, and protect sensitive data in commercial and industrial spaces. IT service providers will need to be proactive in management of patches, device monitoring, and your security policy enforcement. So I'm sure everyone's aware that iOS is out there now, but I don't think everyone appreciates how important the security patches are. Everyone's looking, tend to look, tends to look at the bells and whistles that are more of a consumer thing. You can customize your, your control panel now. You can customize your screens more. That's all well and good. It's nice that the, oper the operating system is moving forward, but the real concerns are these security concerns. Next up, CISA chimes in and orders patching of exploited Windows vulnerabilities. This one comes to us from Bleeping Computer. CISA has issued a warning to U.S. federal agencies urging them to secure their systems against the Windows MS HTML spoofing vulnerability, which is a CVE 2024-43461 which has uh, been exploited by the Advanced Persistent Threat Group Void Banshee. So this is an exploit that's already in the wild and being used. While Microsoft initially categorized the flaw as inactive, subsequent reports indicated that attackers had exploited it prior to the release of the patch. The vulnerability, when combined with another MSHTML flaw, CVE 2024-38112, allows remote code execution through malicious websites or compromised files, putting systems at significant risk. Again, this is a major security concern. How is it going to affect enterprise-level users? Well, remote code execution, whether you're a consumer or an enterprise user, is always a bad thing. Organizations face increased risks particularly in environments heavily reliant on Windows-based systems and browsers like Internet Explorer, which use the MSHTML engine. Now, who, who is using Internet Explorer now? Whoever you are, you, you don't want really to use that at this point in time. That, that much is obvious. I know it's tied into a lot of legacy systems. Uh, we had a very difficult time at my company getting away from it. It was an expensive transition that we had to go through. But uh, it has paid off significantly since we did it. Uh, there should also be a heightened patch management urgency out there right now. Companies will need to prioritize immediate patching across all Windows systems, especially since the vulnerability has been actively exploited. This may lead to an increased burden on IT services, requiring swift vulnerability scanning, rapid deployment of patches, and thorough testing to ensure that systems remain operational post-update. 
Additionally, you have elevated security monitoring and responses that should be in place. Due to the potential for remote code execution, organizations will likely need to intensify their network monitoring and incident response capabilities. Security teams may deploy more aggressive intrusion detection and prevention measures and review logs for any indicators of compromise related to the vulnerability, especially for organizations targeted by APT groups. Uh, Most organizations that have a solid cybersecurity contingent in place have the ability to ramp up log analysis or log monitoring, uh, adjust your tolerances on your alerts. This is one of those things where you probably want to go from whatever your standard level of alert awareness is to an elevated level. You know, if you're if you're talking green, yellow, red, and you normally operate at green, go to a, a level, a yellow level there. Make sure people are aware of it. Make sure people are, are hypersensitive to it and make sure your your response teams are are much more diligent in their log analysis so that you can see any symptoms. You also have to worry about industrial control systems. This may have an impact there as well. In industrial environments where legacy systems are common, unpatched Windows systems used for operations and industrial control could be highly vulnerable. The vulnerability might allow threat actors to compromise critical infrastructure leading to production downtime, safety risks, or manipulation of industrial processes. Supply chain and third-party risk is another consideration, uh, given all the news that we've been seeing in the Middle East with the pagers and radios um, being exploited through supply chain attacks. With many organizations relying on third-party vendors and partners that may use Windows-based platforms, This vulnerability could propagate through supply chain attacks. Companies will need to assess the security postures of their vendors and partners to ensure they're addressing the issues adequately. And ultimately, in the end, really the only thing that's going to help combat this uh, is user awareness and training. As the vulnerability can be triggered by users visiting malicious websites or opening compromised files, IT departments will need to conduct enhanced user awareness training, focusing on phishing, prevention, and safe browsing practices. Such initiatives will be critical to reducing the risk of accidental exposure. I can't say enough about user awareness training. The one biggest threat to all systems, all cybersecurity systems, really is users. If, If we didn't have users that we had to support, cybersecurity would be a lot easier. The Windows MS HTML vulnerability poses significant risks across commercial and industrial sectors, requiring immediate action in patching, monitoring, and user training to mitigate potential attacks. So they were the two stories I pulled out of the news today. I thought they were relevant for a kickoff of the podcast. Uh, Some weeks we'll have more news, some weeks we'll have less, but I think these were the ones that stuck out to me the most. So we're going to take our second break, and when we come back, we're going to get into our deep dive number one. We'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Technology, episode one. 
Now we're going to get into a bit of a deep dive. This one's kind of an easy one right now and one that I had queued up for some time now. So we've been podcasting, as I said earlier, for well over six years now. I've encountered a lot of people that podcast. I've been invited on several podcasts myself. I just did another one a couple of weeks ago. So uh, the idea here was let's talk about how we produce our podcast. Because one of the things that is invariably asked of me over and over again through the years since I've been doing the, the podcast is how do you do it? What equipment do you need? What's involved? How complicated? What's the expense? So we're going to talk a little bit about that now. Um, there's too much to talk about in a single deep dive. So for this deep dive, we're going to talk about how to make a podcast, and we're going to talk about just the hardware that we're using here. So we're going to talk about some cameras, what cameras we use, what video switching we use, what audio mixers, and so forth. Um, we'll talk about, in another deep dive later on, we'll talk about the software packages that we use. It's nice to have all the hardware in place and do things professionally with all the push buttons. Um, but it gets very complicated, especially when I don't have a producer who can push the buttons for me and I have to run the board myself which I always do, um, I had to come up with some compromises and some workarounds to give me the ability to do it entirely uh, from uh, a single interface uh, rather than jumping through different menus and screens and different pieces of hardware. Uh, and in, in looking at this now, I realize that the one thing that I, I am missing one of the components here, but I'll I'll certainly add that in. I'll talk about it here, but we'll add it in a little bit more detail later. So the first thing I want to talk about is probably what I found to be the most significant thing that has changed, for me at least, with the podcast. When we started out, um, we were using a mixer. You know, that's probably that was that's probably the biggest, biggest or first obstacle people have to overcome is the audio side of things. Yeah, you can you can record it with a headphone, you know, a, a standard gaming mic and stuff like that. But the idea was I wanted to do it professionally. So we started out with an old um, podcasting kit that I had bought off of Amazon that came with the mics and the mic stands and the shock mounts and the, the uh, mixer and everything else. And I f discovered very early on that that wasn't working for me. So the first mixer that we had was a Soundcraft Notepad 8FX 8-channel podcast. Um, this one had eight channels in it, only two of which were for mics. Everything else was for lining and so forth. And I found the phantom power on it to be kind of wonky. It never really worked the way it was advertised. And it only had a single headphone output, so you didn't have monitor headphones for other people. So I moved on from that when I started doing guest interviews and so forth on the other podcasts. I needed more mics, obviously, involved. So we upgraded to a Behringer 12, which gave me four mics, but I still only had one monitor output for headphones. So I had to use a, a, a quarter-inch headphone breakout box, a powered breakout box to to give all the other hosts the ability to actually hear the headphones. And then uh, probably a year or so, maybe a year or so into podcasting, I stumbled on the Rode Pro the Rodecaster Pro. And this not only was this a super sexy looking mixer, it was a super capable mixer. It had um, your, all your channels were on sliders. You can individually control them. It had built-in digital effects that you could do on the fly. Uh, it had multiple outputs for your headphones. It even had a sound pad that you could program and, and, and latch to and everything else. In fact, it was so cool looking. It actually appeared in an episode of WandaVision in, uh, one of the, uh, tents, where they had the command station set up. <clears throat> I forget which episode. If I if I look it up, I'll I'll mention it later. I'll drop it in the show notes. So we ran with that for the majority of of the podcast that we did. 
And then I guess it was two years ago, maybe less than two years ago, the Rodecaster Pro 2 came out. Now, the 2 came out. It was a similar, fully integrated design. Um, it had better sound effects, better effects to it. Um, it gave me all the channels. The channels are now programmable. The outputs, uh, I've got multiple channel outputs that are programmable. It'll record, just like with the original Rodecaster, it records directly to the memory card that you have in the mixer. So if you took this out to do a podcast on the road, you don't need to have anything else with it except your microphones and your headphones. You can record the entire audio on this all in one shot. It has a fully uh, configurable touchscreen on it. The um, sound pads are more versatile than they used to be, which is really nice. Uh, but it just sounds great. The, the, the effects are incredibly easy to use. You can either adjust the headphone, the microphone inputs on the touchscreen itself, or you can use a companion piece of software to do it, which you can also use to uh, configure the device, do firmware updates on it, and um, copy your files down as well, which is very nice. So this is my mixer of choice. I retained the original roadcaster for any travel shows that i had to do which i put a whole travel kit together and still haven't done a single show on the road yet i did one on the road but that was with the old stuff very i think it was like episode two or three we did of insights into teens and entertainment uh, so that's the mixer that we're using right now now i did originally start out as far as microphones go uh we had originally started out with Samson uh, Q2Us, which are nice mics. They're they're condenser mics, and what's nice about them is they're both XLR or USB, and they're strange in that they're kind of self-contained because there's a headphone jack on them as well. So if you run them as USB, you can power the mic, you can get headphone jack plugged into it, and you can do everything right through it. They had a decent sound to them. I didn't really have a, a problem with them. Um, my, well, I did have a problem, otherwise I wouldn't have switched, but they wound up picking up too much noise in the background. They were very sensitive. So I moved over to um, Rode NT1A. So the one thing that's nice about the Rodecaster is it has pre-configured settings for select microphones, pretty much all the Rode mics, obviously, um, but a few other models as well. So we had went with Rode NT1As, the anniversary edition microphones, and they were they came very highly rated. I love the microphones themselves. Um, they're condenser mics, so they're super sensitive um, to everything. It picks up everything in the room, um, but it everything it picks up is crystal clear. And the problem that I was running into one, they're huge. And they're exceedingly heavy, so I had to have special uh, mic booms for them. And they were just unwieldy with the cameras because they, they have, you know, the shock mount, they've got the windscreen on them, and they were just, they were just this massive um, entity that floated around that you had to try to struggle to position so it wasn't covering people's faces on the cameras. So that, that kind of became a little, they became more of the picture than the, than the hosts were. So about a year ago, year and a half ago, I moved over our main mics to um, Shure SM7Bs, which everyone has, has I've talked to about Rode microphones, said that, that the NT1As were great and, and you don't need anything else, until I talked to people that use the Shure mics. And these are studio quality mics. They're, they're really great mics. Um, they're not cheap. They're, they're probably middle to upper end of the road as far as studio mics would go for, but they have a much, first of all, a much smaller footprint, which made it easier on the cameras, but they also had a much, um, softer, a much warmer sound to them than the NT, the road NT one A's. Um, the problem that I ran into with the NT one A's aside from the fact that they were massive 
was they were so sensitive that my neighbor's dog would bark. And, and I've got a fairly well soundproof room here in the studio. But the neighbor's dog would bark, and I'd, I'd pick it up as though the dog was sitting next to me. They were so, so sensitive. Um, the SM7Bs, I don't have that problem with. They're, they're high-quality mics, but their pickup range is much shorter than what the NT1As had. It doesn't carry as well, which is great for a talk show. It's terrible if you want to be outside trying to use it as a boom mic. Um, so... We're using the the SM7Bs now, and and I couldn't be happier with them. Um, the other nice thing is that the roadcasters actually do have uh, pre-configured mics for the SM7Bs and a couple of other Shure mics as well because of how popular they are. So it made it much easier to transition over to them than it, if I had to go in there and reprogram all the settings for a different microphone. The other thing worth mentioning here as well is the mic booms. Now, I talked about the need for a specialized mic boom um, for the NT1As. When I bought that original podcasting kit ages ago, it came with really a couple of cheapo mic booms, the kind that have, you know, they're spring loaded and the springs are on the outside. They're really not designed for any kind of heavy weight on the end. I think they're rated the two and a half pounds maybe three pounds. And the NT1As came in at a hefty, almost five pounds with their shock mount and everything else. So they're beefy microphones. Um, so when we started out, we started out using um, the Knox gear uh, studios and, 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 you know, they were designed to be used with um, the Yetis, the, Yeti snowball microphones and so forth. So they're, they were designed for a, a, a bigger uh, type of microphone, uh, but they didn't have the external springs on them. So you didn't have that un, unwieldy industrial look to them. They were much sleeker. Um, and they worked out well. And then I stumbled across these when we did a re, uh, refurbishment of the studio. These are Sensic SA3 booms, and they look super sexy. Um, the one thing that I really like about them is there are cable channels in them with uh, channel covers, so I can run my mic cables inside the actual booms themselves without ever seeing them or having the, you know, with the previous ones I had to Velcro the cables flush to the boom arm and so forth so that they weren't hanging out. Uh, so the cable channels are really nice. The other thing that's nice about the SA30s is there's a extension mount that you can get for the base that they go into. There are tension mount bases that I'm using here. You can either screw them to the desk or you can tension mount them. But there was an extension, which was nice because I've got all the studio equipment, mixer and everything on my desk here where I run the board. And the standard mount would put the microphone too low. It would interfere with the equipment. But the extension mount that it comes with brings it up another, I think, five inches, uh, which just gave me a lot more options as far as mic positioning and so forth, which I like. And these are gorgeous. They're, they're rated for heavier microphones. Um, the tension springs in the elbows are fully adjustable. You can pop off. They've got a... Uh, uh, screw covers over top of them so you don't see any of the hardware they're just a really slick and, and smooth and their their movements very smooth you don't get a lot of the squeaking you don't get the friction that you would normally get so they're they're very good mic and i know i'm spending entirely too much time on on microphone boom mounts here but you'd be surprised the things that that you find important when you're doing you know 300 plus podcasts and, and what what becomes important to you so moving on from that and that's that's the bulk of the audio stuff i don't think there's really anything much else i mean i could talk about the headphones but i've been through several different pairs of headphones i can certainly post i didn't look those up either i can post what they are um, but headphones are, are far less significant to this the important thing is capturing high quality audio for the podcast itself, the headphones are just for monitoring it so you can hear your voice, 
and understand if you're coming through audibly. The next thing I wanted to talk about was the video hardware. So there's a couple, there's really two big things here that we had to deal with. One was the cameras. Now, when we first started out, we didn't even have cameras. We were doing these downstairs in my family room. I'd set up a, a card table for the duration of the podcast, and we would just simply record audio for it. When we decided to start doing video, I didn't want to invest a lot of money into cameras until I knew I could do it and I knew it would work. So we started out with an array of web cameras. Uh, I had about five or six Logitech uh, C922X ProStream webcams that I was using. And I was just soft switching them through OBS at the time, which is what we do our our recording and our broadcasting through. And and it worked, but you know, they were webcams. They you didn't have good lenses, you didn't have any zoom on them. They they were better webcams than than most for low light, but they weren't really designed for low light. So lighting became an issue. Uh, lighting has always been an issue. Anytime you do video, lighting is an issue. So we moved over to um after extensive reviews and research, we moved to the Canon Vixia HF R800s. And that's that's what we have now. Um, I currently have, uh, I think, two. Hang on. Um, I forgot my key combination here. Here we go. And jump back over to this shot here. This is what they look like. They're camcorders. They're digital camcorders. There's nothing super special about them. They're nice. They're compact. They've got uh, a decent zoom on them. Um, they they're rated at 57 times zoom, but that's that's obviously a digital fictional zoom. Um, but they've got standard uh, camera mounts on the bottom of them. They've got a flip out window, monitor window, which is nice. Uh, and they, they do well on low light and they're just 1080p. I have no, no need or desire to shoot anything above 1080p just so I can post it on, you know, Twitch or, or YouTube. There's no need to go anything higher than that for what I'm doing. And for the most part, they have a decent, you know, color gamut to them. They've got, um, nice, uh, rich colors that come out of them. I don't use any of the audio functions on them. Uh, they're run into a switcher and the, everything else comes in through the, the sound mixer. But I've got four of these in the studio. Well, I've got three of them in the studio. I have a, a fourth camera shot here, which isn't on right now, uh, that we're going to be replacing with uh, a fourth one of these Vixias, which I don't think you can buy them anymore. I think they're discontinued. I don't know what model replaced them. I'll have to do a little research. I'm not in the market to replace these anytime soon though so i'm not in a hurry for that um so those those are the cameras that we've got and i've got four of them mounted on the walls here uh my son yells at me when i when i hit my fourth camera view because i'm breaking the fourth wall um but if i have a guest in the studio i kind of have to so we're going to get that one set up uh, for a two shot for me as well uh, so they're all fed into um a black magic Yeah, there we go. Black Magic ATEM Mini Pro. In fact, I don't think I have the Pro. I think I have the the standard Mini, which isn't available anymore. Um, but this is a great little device. It's three hundred bucks. It's got four video channels in. It'll take audio in. It's got an HDMI out if you want to run it to a monitor. Uh, you can do effects with it. You can do lower thirds. You can do graphics. You can do transitions and wipes and 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 things of that nature it's for the price it's one of the most versatile switchers that's out there um and what's really nice is i don't even have mine available to it. mine's actually tucked in underneath of of the stand for my sound mixer so i never even touch it except to turn it on it's fully controllable by software there's a usb port on it there's a network port on it 
You can connect to it over IP, which is how I connect to it. And it has a native software package that if you have a touch screen, which my main monitor here happens to be a touch screen, uh, you can control the whole thing through the touch screen itself interface. You can work the sliders, you can work the wipes, you can do everything with it. It's it's really convenient as, as anything. Um, but it also works with a piece of software that I use that kind of brings everything together too, which was very nice. Uh, but that's the black magic uh to, from black magic design the atem mini um or the mini pro as the case may be now uh, these were the the video side of things and and really that's that's all we've got as far as video equipment i've tried since i since i did the latest setup i tried to set up uh, a couple of webcams the the, the only problem that i run into with the atem switcher which I kind of miss from the webcams is I can only do a single shot. There's a picture in picture shot that I can do, but it doesn't really go well with a, a podcast. Uh, the advantage I had prior to our current setup was I had the ATAM switcher, the four HDMI cameras coming in. And then I had two close up web cameras uh, of the Logitech setup. And the Logitechs would allow me to do simultaneous shots of the Logitech or the ATEM side by side with the Logitechs. Um, other than that, I, I kind of gave up on that because it was a little problematic getting it set up again and getting it working. So, a couple of considerations worth uh, mentioning before we wrap up here. Um, so, from an audio standpoint, just some general hints. Sound conditioning, as you can see, I've got the the sound conditioning panels on the wall here, pretty much covering every square inch of the wall at this point. You need some kind of sound conditioning in the room itself. You want to cut down on echoes. You want to cut down on vibrato coming back to you from the corners. Um, and you want to kind of try to isolate it from outside noise as well, which, which these help to do as well. Um, I use the tiles. In fact, I've gone through several different selections of tiles. If you look behind me, uh, you can probably see at least three different style of tiles that I haven't gotten around to swapping all of them out. Uh, I started out with one-inch tiles. They were the one-inch wedge tiles. And then I moved over to two-inch tiles. I'm still, I still have some one-inch ones there that we couldn't take down because of some of the uh, decorations we have on the wall. But blankets worked. When we first started out, the, the wall behind me had was hung with a comforter because uh, I didn't have enough tiles at the time. And, and that works fine, just enough to, to have some kind of disruption of the sound itself so you're not getting echo all over the place. Uh, you just you need to limit the echo. You need to absorb some of the sound. One of the things you can do is try the, the, the bass traps. Uh, these are the heavy foam wedges that go up in the corners of the room where your, your bass tends to reflect from the most. Um, the one thing I will say is I, I found a huge difference going from one inch to two inch acoustic tiles, even though all my acoustic tiles didn't switch over. The two inch ones that I have in there had a huge difference. We're talking significant percentage difference. A couple of issues that, that came out of the, the sound. Um, cooling the room became an issue because not only does it insulate sound, it also insulates thermally as well. So if, if you want to lower your cost of your heating, putting sound acoustic tiles all over the place tends to help with that. Um, the problem was, is it made the room hot. Um, we have central air here. And even in this room, the central air is actually pretty good. But with all the equipment that's in here giving off heat and the acoustic tiles insulating the room, uh, summertime, it gets pretty unbearable in here. So we put what was billed as a uh, ultra quiet window air conditioner, which is anything but quiet. Ultimately, I had to build a uh, a, a baffle, a, a sound baffle that allowed me to lay it over the air conditioner to arrest most of that sound while still allowing airflow, which that's an interesting engineering challenge if you want to have a talk about that. Um, but my baffle managed to cut down the sound from the air conditioner by about 30%. So video, 
All right, so some general hints with video. Video by any standard is not necessary for podcasts. If you want to start out podcasting, audio is is the easiest, most cost-effective, and least troublesome way of doing it. If you're overly ambitious like I was and decided you want to do video, which after doing video, I kind of kicked myself and wondered why I went that way, but that's neither here nor there. If you want to do it, understand that doing video is difficult. Cabling, bandwidth, storage, um, everything is difficult with video. If video takes podcasting. If podcasting on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most difficult, audio podcasting is probably a 2 or 3. If you add video to the mix, you're all automatically looking at a 5 or 6. It's just the logistics involved. Um, because then you get in the lighting. Uh, unless you have exceptionally expensive cameras that work exceedingly well in low light, you're going to need supplemental lighting. Uh, I've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve supplemental lights in here, in addition to the floor standing lamps. 13, sorry, 13, in addition to the floor standing lamps that I have just to get the lighting effects that I need so it doesn't look terrible. Um, so that's that's something you have to take into consideration. I would also recommend if you're going to do this uh, and you want to do video, get a camera with its optical zoom on it. Um, I found setting them up on the other side of the room and zooming in tends to be much more forgiving on the subject, and it tends to be much more tolerant of changing light conditions, which is important. Um, so mount them, too. That's the other thing. Mount your cameras. Don't stick them on a tripod. I tried that early on, and I had them on tripods. I had them on flex mounts. I had them on boom mounts. Anything that can move on video will move. Unless you bolt it down. That's that's one of the rules that I've learned. And the last thing you want is a shaky video camera when you're trying to do uh, a podcast. Nobody wants to watch shaky video. Some issues to keep in mind. And then we can wrap this up pretty quickly. Bandwidth. So when I started doing this with webcams, I did all the webcams through a single USB hub that was supposed to have enough bandwidth. But if I had all four cameras going on a four-bang shot, I would get glitching in there because of bandwidth issues. Now everything's HDMI. It goes back to a single unit. Bandwidth is less of an issue. It is an issue if you're going to be broadcasting or if you're going to be uploading these to a podcast site because video tends to be exceedingly large. Um, which brings me to storage space. So for each episode that we do, which is anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour, we store all the raw video, all the raw audio. We do a compiled version of each audio and video, and then we do a final mastered version before we put them out. All of that storage on average per episode takes up just under five gigabytes. Five gig. Yeah, five gigabytes which is a lot. If I did just the audio, you're looking at probably less than 100 megabytes. So keep that in mind. You're going to need a lot of storage. And when you have a final product, it's going to take you a long time to upload it. Now, sites like YouTube, you can upload it to without a problem. But some of the um, hosting sites that do video podcast, we happen to use Podbean. And we'll talk about our providers later. We use Podbean. Podbean has a hard limit on how large you can send up. So every time I do a finalized one that I can send to YouTube, and then have to take that, run it through a piece of software, scale it down, drop the frame rate down, drop the bit rate down, and get it to a, a viewable level, but it doesn't look as good as I'd like, but it gets it to the point that they'll accept it. So keep that in mind. And then the last thing to keep in mind is your audio video sync. So if you're like, in my case, I'm recording on a uh, a mixer and I'm, I'm recording audio on the mixer and video on the cameras. I'm not taking the audio 
from the cameras. So I, I don't take any audio from the cameras. Now, if you're familiar with Photoshop, or not Photoshop, Premiere, Adobe Premiere, Adobe Premiere has an option where you can take multiple clips that are shot simultaneously and synchronize them, usually based on the audio of them. It, it looks at the waveforms in the audio and lines them up. If you're not getting audio on your video tracks, which I'm not because I don't record it, it makes it a little bit more difficult. So in that case, you you want to have some kind of visual reference or something like that that you can synchronize to. And that's just going to help you on post-production more than anything else. Um, but that's it. That's the hardware side of things. I'm um, sure there was a couple of things I missed. I didn't talk about my stream deck. I didn't talk about my touchscreen monitor. Um, it, we might have another miscellaneous deep dive or I may throw this into the tail end of the software that I don't think is going to go as long. Uh, but that's it. That is episode one of Insights into Technology. Thank you for joining me. Before you go, I do want to take an opportunity once more to invite everyone to subscribe to the podcast. You can find us listed on Insights into Things. Um, you can find that on Apple, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, any place you can get a podcast. I would also invite you to email in, give us your feedback. You can get us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can find us on Instagram at instagram.com slash insights into things. Or you can call into us at 856 403 87 that's 856-403-8788. Leave us a message if it is appropriate and you would like it on the air. We will be sure to incorporate it into a later episode. Again, that's 856-403-8788. Or you can find links to all that and more on our official website at insightsintothings.com. That's it. Another one in the books.